Tonight on the readout. I would have wiped the floor with the guys that weren't loyal, which I will now do, which is great. You know, I love getting even with people, but I will, <laughs> I will up. wipe. You love getting even oh, with Oh, absolutely. People. If given the opportunity, I will get even with some people that were disloyal to me. I mean, I had a group of people that were disloyal. But how do you I define disloyalty? Uh, they didn't come to my aid. Long before he was president, Trump was already acting and talking like a mob boss. And after this week's explosive testimony from former West Wing aide Cassie Hutchinson, we're learning about the mob-like tactics Team MAGA is using to try to keep people quiet. Also tonight, Florida's dystopian don't say gay law takes effect causing havoc in schools and fear among LGBTQ teachers. And later, my friend Nicole Wallace joins me to talk about a major television event she is leading this weekend to raise money for the victims of Putin's aggression in Ukraine. But we begin tonight with a journey back in time to an era when a Republican actually took on mob-style tactics. Like most Americans, you probably don't know a lot about Thomas E. Dewey, other than this infamous photo prematurely and incorrectly declaring the then governor of New York president over incumbent Harry Truman in 1948. Long before that, Dewey made his name as a special prosecutor, targeting the era's most notorious figures, like Irving Wexler, a.k.a. Waxy Gordon, a notorious bootlegger and a name that may sound familiar to Boardwalk Empire fans. Nucky Thompson. Johnny Torrio, Rothstein, Waxy Gordon, they have problems that come to us. Exactly why we don't need them. Well, in 1933, Waxy Gordon's problem was that he was being prosecuted for tax evasion by Thomas Dewey. The New York Times reported that he was in custody when his trial opened because witnesses against the beer racketeer received threats. In fact, Dewey told the court most of the witnesses we call have been thoroughly intimidated. Now, Dewey won that case, presenting more than 100 witnesses to put Gordon away for paying just $10 in taxes in 1930, evading hundreds of thousands of dollars in income taxes. So why is Waxy Gordon's prosecution relevant today? Well, the House January 6th investigation is not a mob prosecution, but the way that it's playing out is revealing lots and lots of mob-style tactics, including allegations of possible witness tampering and intimidation. At the end of Cassie Hutchinson's testimony last week, Vice Chair Liz Cheney gave two examples, including this one. This is a call received by one of our witnesses. Quote, a person let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. Now, lots of journalists, including myself, wondered who the witness was who was, being who was being tampered with, since it was not stated at Tuesday's hearing. Well, NBC News has confirmed that that veiled warning was sent to Hutchinson. Two sources say that she was contacted by someone attempting to influence her testimony. And a source familiar with Hutchinson's deposition says the person referenced at the beginning of that message was former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. Meadows, the spokesman, has denied that he or anyone in his camp attempted to influence Hutchinson's testimony. But a reminder, he could always just answer the committee's subpoena and say that under oath. There's also the question of why we even received this public testimony from Cassidy Hutchinson. Former Trump White House official Alyssa Farah revealed on Thursday that she is the one who put Hutchinson in touch with Liz Cheney. Trump world was assigning lawyers to a lot of these um, these staffers who themselves, you know, don't Wait, have big signing lawyers. Well, I should say covering the cost of lawyers for um, people who don't have big legal defense funds to themselves. Oh, so they were paying own. Cassidy Hutchinson's lawyer. Is my understanding? You'd have to confirm that. But she had someone uh, Positano, who Stephen Positano, who'd been in the White House Counsel's office, is still aligned with Trump World. She did her interview. She complied with the committee. But she shared with me, um, there is more I want to share that was not asked in those settings. How do we do this? And um, in, that, in that process, she got a new attorney of her own. In fact, MSNBC has confirmed that according to financial disclosures, the Trump Save America Political Action Committee was making regular payments to the firm of the lawyer representing Hutchinson until she changed attorneys about a month before testifying. Her current lawyer, Jody Hunt, is, by the way, a longtime ally of former Trump Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who Trump chased out of the job for refusing to fire Robert Mueller. The new attorney served as Sessions' chief of staff. 
And joining me now is Joyce Vance, professor at the University of Alabama School of Law and a former U.S. attorney, along with Tim O'Brien, senior columnist for Bloomberg Opinion. Thank you both for being here. Joyce, I'm going to start with you. Explain where the line is between reaching out to a witness and saying, hey, you know, uh, our client really loves you and, and is always following what you're doing. And I just want to let you know, you know, Trump reads those transcripts. Where does that become witness intimidation and a crime? Well, like all things, it's a matter of degree, Joy. But the federal statute that makes it a crime to intimidate or tamper with a witness is very broad. It covers, for instance, an unsuccessful attempt to keep a witness from testifying. It covers any effort to have a witness not fully disclose or disclose false information or hold back some relevant details. So when you look at this in context and think about whether that email or those communications constitute a threat, you don't have to look just at that single communication alone. You can look at the entire course of conduct in regard to how witnesses have been treated, how the inquiry into January 6th has been uh, treated by Mark Meadows in this instance, perhaps by the former president. And DOJ will have every incentive to take a close look at this situation because ultimately the justice system is about getting to the truth. And when you have people who engage in this sort of effort to intimidate particularly a relatively young witness to remind her that she need not cross a line, that she might get in trouble if she crosses that line, even absent some sort of an explicit threat, this could amount to witness intimidation under the statute. And, and to say with you just for a moment, Joyce, because the, the her former employer or somebody associated with her former employer paying for her lawyers that in and of itself is not a crime or not improper right but do you see something suspicious in the fact that she came forward only after changing lawyers away from the the MAGA lawyers to a different set of attorneys and that that prompted her to come forward do you then detect that because it, it sure did feel like Liz Cheney was implying that that there was something criminal going on that she keeps on making that implication like she's screaming to the Justice Department about it and and that did I did notice that last uh, last week that that was one of the things that happened she switched lawyers it looks like what you see in organized crime cases joy where you'll see someone who will not cooperate with the government who will stick to a story that doesn't make sense and then sometimes you'll see them sort of have an awakening. Sometimes the new lawyer comes first. Sometimes there's some signaling that they'd like to have a new lawyer, and that's arranged. So this feels familiar to me, and I have to tell you that the context makes me very uncomfortable to think that I would compare this sort of situation instinctively to something that I've seen in cases involving organized crime. But it's tough to draw any other sort of a conclusion here. And it's hard. It, well, it's easy to do it, Tim, Tim O'Brien, if you're familiar with Donald Trump, who has a long history of sort of, it's, you know, being around sort of mafioso style people. Uh, let me play Michael Cohen real quick. This is Michael Cohen describing the way that Trump behaves and the way he behaved, including toward him. He was Trump's lawyer at one time. I was looking at the text messages and the communications that Liz Cheney put up mm. and the words were all the same. You are loved. Right. Uh, you are in our corner. Remain in our corner. We will take care of you. What is he saying when he says he's on you, thinking about you, looking at you? Yeah, it's, he's trying to be like a mob boss. He's throwing his arms around you and telling you you're protected. I'm the president of the United States of America. I'm the most powerful man on the planet. Either you stay on my side or you will suffer from my ire. And that's exactly what happened to me. You know, and Tim, in this case, the you know, at least the reporting is indicating that it wouldn't necessarily be Trump, but it's Meadows sort of acting in the guise of Donald Trump saying the boss, you know, he reads transcripts. He knows what's going on. And it's sort of, it's allegedly Meadows who does deny it. And then there's also this sort of MAGA attack, sort of swarm attack on this 25 year old young woman. Um, it sure does feel mob like. Well, you know, in Donald Trump's case, it, Joy, it's not just metaphorical. You know, Donald Trump's original business partners in Atlantic City were mobbed up. He intersected with the mob quite literally throughout his entire business career. Um, he told me he openly admired um, mobsters like John Gotti, 
He, he, he talked to me on a number of occasions about how when Gotti came under pressure, he made sure everyone around him walked the line and he didn't flinch in court and he never cried. Trump spoke glowingly about that. And he has a long history of trying to intimidate anybody who doesn't allow him to get his own way. Uh, he went after various mayors of New York when he didn't get zoning he wanted. In Atlantic City, uh, his lawyer there was the uncle of Don McGahn, his White House counsel, Patty McGahn, who was plugged in to the regulatory structure in Atlantic City and would pound away at that when Trump wanted his own way. And then remember when he began running for president, uh, he went after Judge Curiel in the Trump University suit. Um, uh, impugning his his objectivity because he was, quote unquote, an immigrant, which he wasn't. But Trump went directly at him. During the impeachment process, when Marie Ivanovich was testifying, Trump began tweeting directly at her during her testimony. Robert Mueller's investigation was replete with instances in which Trump was publicly signaling through his Twitter feed what he expected out of his minions. Uh, you should be like Roger Stone and keep quiet. Don't be like Michael Cohn and 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 spill the beans. Uh, all of that at the time, I think, was also directed at Paul Manafort, who was under investigation and ultimately imprisoned. Um, and then he rolls into this situation, which he's actually never faced before. He has gotten away with trying to strong arm people and corrupt legal and regulatory processes his whole life. But now he has the full force of a congressional committee scrutinizing this behavior. And I think the distinct possibility of the Department of Justice weighing this evidence and coming after him for obstruction of justice and witness tampering.